Myanmar is the modern name for Burma, and we flew into Yangon, formerly Rangoon. We started our tour at the Chattery Motel on the outskirts of the city. Directly opposite the hotel is the Royal Lake, where we decided to spend our first afternoon. Going through reception and out of the hotel gate, we came to the entrance to the 110-acre nature park which surrounds the lake. On the edge of the lake is a concrete replica of a Burmese royal barge, which was built in 1972 and now houses a restaurant. We stopped here for a cool drink. There are lots of bars and restaurants, and we continued walking round the lake to this one, where we had an excellent meal for £6.50 for two. Back at the hotel there was a product lodge for pot noodles, so we went to bed to sleep off the jet lag. We took advantage of the hotel's free shuttle bus the following morning and were dropped outside the Sule Pagoda in the city centre. Across the road is the Maha Bandula Park, which is surrounded by some of the most important buildings of the area, such as the City Hall and High Court. It was a public holiday, so all the locals were out strolling in the park, dressed in their finest clothes. Even the little kids were dressed up for the occasion. Others just took the opportunity to relax. Quite a few people asked if they could take our photograph, so we returned the favour. <laughs> Leaving the park, we walked down the main road, which seemed to double as a market, selling fruit, sugarcane juice and fast food. Oh dear. Eventually we came to Chinatown. This may be an attractive area by night, but during the day it looks a bit scruffy. We came across a Chinese temple and went for a look round. Buddhists do seem to have taken LED lighting to their hearts. By now it was lunchtime and everyone was eating street food. I couldn't resist one of these pancakes with eggs, beans and coconut. Whilst it was cooking, we watched the lady at the next stall making betel nut chews. Eventually my pancake was ready and piping hot. It cost 500 chat, 
a whole 27 pence. These pigeons were eating leftover rice. We all met up the following morning in reception where the musicians were playing local instruments. First stop was at the local food market which sold lots of fresh produce from the surrounding countryside. Housewives go to the market twice a day to make sure they buy only the freshest ingredients. Vegetables are cheap but meat is very expensive. Women in Myanmar spread thanaka, a cosmetic paste made from bark, on their cheeks as makeup and sunscreen. I wouldn't want to be an electrician in this city. These cars cost a bit of a stir. Most city dwellers live in apartments like these. Next, we went to the railway station. The buildings are very elaborate. We had a bit of time before our train, so we had a look round the station. Eventually our train arrived and we got into our ordinary class carriage for a circular ride around the outskirts of Yangon and had a chance to mix with the locals as they went about their daily business. As we left the train, market traders were bringing on their produce. We then went to a Buddhist temple, where we had to take off our shoes and socks before we went in. This was something we would have to do many times in the course of the tour. The temple houses a 217 foot long reclining Buddha statue, one of the largest in the country. Work began on the statue in the 1950s and it was consecrated in 1973. The statue's glass eyes measure 5 foot 10 inches by 1 foot 11 inches. Pretty gardens surround the temple and it's staffed by friendly monks. Small shrines within the temple contain one image for each day of the week and it's customary to wash the image associated with the day you were born. We were always provided with towels to clean our feet at the end of each temple visit. Our next stop was at Babioki Market. This is an indoor market mostly selling jade ornaments and jewellery. There were also stalls selling paintings and clothing. The highlight of Yangon is Shui Dagon Pagoda, which is reached by this lift. The pagoda consists of hundreds of colourful temples, stupas and statues, reflecting its 2,500 year history. Many of the buildings and statues are gold-plated. The main central pagoda is almost 360 feet high.
Bowls are filled with oil for use later in the evening. All round the complex, devotees wash the Buddha statues. These pillars are made of sawdust soaked in resin, which is then carved. As dusk falls, flood lighting is turned on. Nuns who have travelled from overseas were posing for photographs. The very top of the main stupa is encrusted with 4,531 diamonds, the largest of which weighs 72 carats. The highest point in the temple grounds is the most popular for worshippers. We lit wicks sitting in the bowls of oil before leaving the complex. First thing the following morning we flew to Hiho and drove to Kalor, a former British hill station. From here we went to a small village for the start of a trek through the countryside. The 17 year old helper on the right hoped for a future as a tour guide. After the first couple of miles it became obvious that the walk was going to be much harder than we'd expected. So Chris and some other members of the group opted for a lift in a truck. The rest of us continued along the tracks into the hills. This valley grew rice in the wet season and cabbages in the dry. The path began to climb quite steeply and soon we could see the village where we were to have lunch on the far hillside. An hour or so later we came to the outskirts of the village and chatted to these friendly women. In the centre of the village was the Buddhist temple. Whilst male monks wear saffron robes, female monks wear pink. In the back room of one of the houses, the family were preparing our lunch on the floor, as is the norm in the East. The meal was traditional Burmese, light on meat and heavy on vegetables, and delicious especially after the morning's exertions. After lunch, the children formed an orderly line as we gave them gifts of books and pencils. Then, once everybody had some, a scrum formed for those we had left. Just time for a quick visit to the loo before it was time to go down into the next valley. These were dragon fruit trees. After a well earned night's sleep we went back to Hiho. Here we visited the weekly market where we immersed ourselves in the throng of locals buying their fresh produce. This is where all the cabbages go. Mm -hmm. 
I see. This club was making a bid for freedom. Presumably this is how they got the goods home. Just across the road was a parasol factory, which also sold typical marionettes. We were shown some of the tools used in making the parasols, including this foot operated lathe. In another part of the factory, a lady was pulping bamboo for paper manufacture. The pulp was mixed with water, then spread onto a sieve. Next, petals and leaves were placed on top of the pulp and the sieve lifted from the water to drain. When the paper is dry, it's removed from the sieve. Later, we found some of this paper used to line the glass door to our hotel bathroom. On again, this time to the wooden Shui Yan Pie Monastery which is built of red painted teak and mounted on stilts. As usual we had to take off our shoes and socks to enter to see the gold buddhas. The monastery was built to educate poor boys and their dormitory is at the back. The monks here live a communal life. On leaving we cleaned our feet then walked round the outside of this lovely building. Just a short distance away we came to the landing stage where we were met by the fleet of longboats in which we were going to spend a lot of time over the next couple of days as we explored the Hindley Lake area. We set off downstream passing interesting buildings and other river users. After a few minutes we came to Inley Lake, a freshwater lake 13 and a half miles long and up to 7 miles wide, though the surrounding marshlands make it seem much bigger. The lake is famous for its fishermen who use conical nets and often row their flat bottomed boats using one leg and one arm, which leaves the other arm free to control the net. We stopped for lunch at this pretty restaurant. After lunch we went out to the back of the restaurant for a walk through the village. We came to another river and saw the Fong Dalwu Pagoda across the water. The footbridge is typical of those to be found all over the Inlay area. Off came our shoes and socks again as we went into the pagoda. It's known for the small Buddha images that have been coated in so many layers of gold leaf that they've lost their original shape. People still apply more layers of gold leaf even now. Our boats picked us up at the monastery and took us to see the villages which were built on stilts in the lake. Many of the houses have floating gardens, which are fastened to the lake bottom by long bamboo poles. We were heading for a weaving workshop, which uses the fibre from lotus stems to make its fabric.
The fibre is dyed on site and this lady makes up the creels of fibres for the wharf for the looms. The boats were waiting outside to take us to a cheroot factory. The ladies worked so fast that try as we might, we couldn't make out how they were doing it. The sun was beginning to set and the fishermen gathering up their nets as we made our way across the lake to our hotel. We stayed at the pristine Lotus, where we had a large bungalow with four poster beds. It was so beautiful here that we spent some time looking around the gardens. After breakfast we went down to the water's edge to study a map of the lake. Our boats were waiting for us and we set off past the hotel's smaller bungalows, through the floating gardens and out onto the lake. Other boats carried commuters to work. The fisherman was trying to scare the fish into his net. We came across one of the cone net fishermen and we surrounded him. He stands on the back of the boat to get a better view of the weed below the surface where the fish live. When he gets to a likely spot he places his frame in the water and pushes it into the mud with his foot. He stirs the weed with his stick and if this disturbs a fish he will feel it bump into the edge of his frame, at which point he drops the net over it. If not, he repeats the process somewhere else. These men are harvesting weed from the lake to use as fertiliser for the floating gardens. It looks extremely heavy. Water runs out from the weed into the bottom of the boat and it's a full-time job bailing out. We continued until we came to the far old village where the long-necked women of the Padong Hill Tribe have set up shop. They wear extremely heavy brass coils around their necks and limbs to make themselves look beautiful. Here too was a market selling all sorts of crafts as well as long yi the traditional skirt worn by men and women. They also sold t-shirts. From here we turned into a side canal. The water levels are controlled by weirs with narrow gaps in the centre that the boats whiz straight through.
The canal ends at Indeen, where we met a group of women from the Black Karen tribe. Passing the market stalls and boat moorings, we came to the Nyong Ohak pagodas. Many have not been restored and are in various stages of disrepair. Some have carvings of celestial beings on their walls. We continued alongside the river past the weir and more market stores. Then we came to a 700 metre covered walkway lined with stalls. This leads to the Shui in Tyne Pagodas. The site contains hundreds of pagodas, mostly dating from the 17th and 18th centuries, although some are from the 14th. The top element, shaped like an ornamental umbrella, is missing from many of the unrestored stupas but some have been collected together here. We walked back through the stores where one of our party decided to buy a Karen headdress. At this restaurant we had a lovely, if large, lunch. After lunch we went back to the head of the canal and returned to the lake. Our next stop was at the Jumping Cat Monastery. Much of the lattice work is gold plated cast iron. The story goes that a Norwegian monk relieved his boredom by training the cats at the monastery to jump. He's no longer there, but the descendants of the cats are, though they can no longer jump. The boat then took us back to the hotel. Our flight this morning took us to Mandalay and we drove straight out to the hill station of Pien Uld Win. Here we took a horse and carriage ride through the old colonial district. It's a bit cramped, and we had to duck to see out. The ride ended at the National Kandogai Gardens. It was developed by a British forest research officer and a lady botanist from Kew Gardens, on which the garden is based. Near the entrance is the formal garden, Beyond this is an area of parkland leading to a petrified wood display. A boardwalk through the swamp passes giant bamboo. Close to the lake is a walk-in aviary.
The orchid garden contains over 300 native species and exotic hybrids. The bridge across the lake passes a pagoda and leads back to the entrance. We went to Pien Ulduin railway station early in the morning. I like the comment for the 132, but ours arrived on time. Lots of independent traders make their living from passengers. I wonder what this sign means. Possibly this. We spent some time watching the activity around the goods wagon. The monk was amongst the last to cross the level crossing before our driver prepared to depart. The train passed villages and farmland on our four hour journey to see the GoTech viaduct. Of course, every village had its temple. Mid morning, the snack lady did her rounds. An hour or so later, ladies from the villagers came aboard to sell lunch. Shortly after, we got the first view of the bridge. It's the highest bridge in Myanmar and, when it was built, the largest railway trestle in the world. The train stopped so we could get off and walk along to the best viewpoint. The bridge components were made in Pennsylvania and assembled on site in 1900. The whole line was constructed as a way for the British Empire to expand their influence in the region. The bridge is 2,260 feet long and crosses a gorge 335 feet deep. The aim was to then get to the Ubain Bridge, a 200-year-old bridge made of 984 teak posts at sunset. But unfortunately it was almost completely dark by the time we got there.
We then drove past a very modern monastery on our way to the hotel. It looks like Las Vegas. It does, doesn't it? Yeah, just the building. Are there any casinos? <laughs> when we got to our hotel room, we had the most amazing views of Mandalay Hill by night. The Mandalay Hill Resort is set in beautiful gardens, which we had time to explore in the morning. To breakfast, we went to Cuthador Pagoda, a World Heritage Site. Here, 729 small shrines contain stone slabs, which are engraved on both sides with Buddhist scriptures. It's often described as the world's largest book. In the centre of the complex is a golden temple. The priest rings a bell as a call to worship. The gold leaf on the temple is reapplied every five years. This girl is wearing the very popular leaf design of Thanaka. Leaving the temple we found this little girl selling poses of flowers. Boys always seem to get it easier. Next stop was the Schwenendor Monastery. It's built in traditional Burmese architectural style and is known for its teak carvings of Buddhist myths on the walls and roof. The carvings are being continuously renovated. Originally it was the king's apartment in the royal palace, but on his death his son had it moved to this site, where he had it rebuilt as a monastery in 1883. Outside, an artist was doing very complicated graffiti work. Different crafts are carried out in different areas of the city and we started in the wood carving and embroidery village. Here the ladies are cleaning lint off a finished piece which feels padded beneath the embroidery. They also make puppets. Down the road was the marble carving area. The statues are often made as blanks and the faces added to order. What on earth are these? Ah, lotus flowers. Another market must mean another pagoda. This time the Mahamuni. Legend has it that only five images of Buddha were made in his lifetime and this temple houses one of them. Only men are allowed to enter the inner sanctum where they decorate the statue with gold leaf. In the temple complex are bronze statues from Angkor Wat in Cambodia. It's believed that pain can be relieved by rubbing the equivalent part on one of the statues. Then it was shoes back on, borrowing the stools from the fast food stall. The last visit of the afternoon was to the gold leaf workshop, where slices of gold are beaten by hand until wafer thin. This process takes up to five and a half hours of continuous hammering. The finished gold leaf is packaged for sale in temples or used to decorate items sold in the shop. Back at the hotel we got a good view of Mandalay Hill by day. 
we got into a little local truck to go up the twisty road to the top of the hill. We went up the escalator to the temple in the very top. From here there are views down over the city and at the sunset over the Irrawaddy River. Another flight took us to Bagan, capital of Myanmar in the 11th to 13th centuries. First we went to the Shwezigon Pagoda, which is a prototype Burmese stupa, reputed to contain a bone and tooth of Buddha. The stupa is completely solid, and this one is surrounded by smaller temples and shrines. In complete contrast is the red brick three-storey Tilaminlo temple. It has a Buddha image on each side and is surrounded by a tourist market. Then we went on to the Ananda temple an architectural masterpiece and one of Bagan's most beautiful temples. In one of these niches is what is believed to be the only statue of Buddha's mother in Myanmar. This image looks to be smiling from a distance but closer to looks more serious. The temple is maintained by donations from the faithful. The outside is just as beautiful as the inside. We had a warm welcome to the hotel at Tharabar Gate. The hotel is laid out over extensive grounds with swimming pool, outdoor breakfast area and rooms in single storey buildings scattered around the gardens. In the early evening we were picked up by horse-drawn carts and taken into the temple area where in the 11th to 13th centuries over 10,000 temples, pagodas and monasteries were built. The remains of over 2,000 still survive. We stopped at Shui Sandor Pagoda with its five terraces, where hundreds of people climbed to see the sunset over the temples. It was quite a climb up very steep steps, but well worth it for the views. climb down was just as difficult. Very few things are worth getting up at five o'clock in the morning for, and the World War II bus that picked us up didn't seem that promising a start. The driver didn't seem to be enjoying himself very much either. We sat cramped in the back as we bumped over the dusty roads, stopping in scrubland at first light. Hundreds of metres of fabric lay on the ground, with big baskets at the end.
Then fans began to fill the fabric with air as a dozen hot air balloons began to take shape. Next, tongues of flame were fired into the open ends and the canopies began to rise. We all climbed into the baskets, the burners were fired up and we rose majestically into the air. First we floated over farmland where a new irrigation system had been installed. Then we passed over the first of the 2,000 plus temples, large and small, which fill the landscape around Magan. After an hour's flight we came into land on the sandbanks at the edge of the Irrawaddy River. It was a very smooth landing with only five gentle bounces on the sand. We then went back up a few feet and the ground crew towed us in. When we were in position the pilot opened the top of the balloon and it slowly deflated. As the ground crew packed the balloon, we had a champagne breakfast. Everybody, chin chin. So, was it worth getting up at five o'clock? You bet it was. Later that day, we went to a toddy farm, where we watched a worker collecting sap from toddy palms. We all had a taste of the sap, which is very sweet. So sweet, in fact, that it's boiled down to produce palm sugar. It can also be fermented to produce palm wine. The ladies had chance to try Thanaka for themselves and chose the leaf design. Some went to operate the peanut oil extraction machinery. <laughs> On then to Mount Popa, a sheer rock topped with the golden stupas of the monastery that sits on its peak. The monastery is reached by climbing several hundred steps, running the gauntlet of monkeys along the way. Of course there's a market to pass through.
Then we went to a rural village where things have changed little since the 11th century. In this house we were told that the grandparents sleep upstairs and the rest of the family underneath. This is their bathroom. The ladies of the village make cloth and sell lacquerware. Meanwhile, the men are hard at work in the fields. In the lacquer factory, bamboo cores are covered with many layers of lacquer. The top layer is scraped back to create a pattern. Gold leaf is then applied, which sticks to the scratched area and is washed off the rest to produce beautiful works of art which are sold in the shop. That evening we went to the banks of the Irrawaddy for a boat ride. It flows from north to south and is the largest river in Myanmar. Because of Rudyard Kipling's poem, it's often referred to as the road to Mandalay. Our final experience of this mystical country was the sun slowly setting over the river.